In this video, we'll look at Andrew Jackson's domestic policies. You know, once in office, Jackson, not surprisingly, went about with a vengeance to attack what he saw as privilege, the elite in government. They'd say, quote, turn the rascals out, unquote, and, you know, let the people rule. Arguing that the people in government should really be their temporary and, you know, actually be private citizens, he argued for the rotation in office to avoid corruption. Jackson probably didn't anticipate how this would play out, but it came to be known as patronage, or the spoils system. It supposedly came from a New York senator who, who famously remarked, quote, to the victor go the spoils, unquote. The spoils system worked in that you removed your predecessors from office and replaced them with your own political supporters. Again, the idea would be fresh people, new opportunity for average people to come in. Of course, to critics of, the, of Jackson, what it was was a reward for political support and people trying to get into government and feed off it. So here's a cartoon that was against the uh, spoils system. It shows Jackson riding a, a pig, you know, going to feed off the, the federal government. Jackson, you know, he had a cabinet, but he relied more on a, a series of political friends that would visit him in the White House. Again, he relied on people that he trusted that were outside of government. And you know, they would stay up late night talking and eating in the White House kitchen, and they became known as the kitchen cabinet. You can see them, some pictures of them here. I'm not going to give you the names of them, but they weren't official cabinet secretaries at the time. I should add as well that in this period, you also see the expansion of the electorate in many states. What they, what they do is they were dropping property requirements to be able to vote, and that undoubtedly uh, was because Jackson was pushing it as a, as a means to enhance the power of the common people. Jackson easily won election in 1832, and thus his presidency lasted through the election of 1836. The effect, he in the 1832 election, he, he defeated his uh, rival Clay 219 to 49 in the uh, Electoral College. The effect of his eight-year tenure was to so exacerbate political tensions that when his term was up, the two distinct political parties were, were clear. They'd already begun to organize. And by the way, Jackson was followed in office by his uh, one of his followers, Martin Van Buren, who I referenced earlier. Political tensions were so sharp from the outset of Jackson's presidency all over the tariff of 1828, the tariff of abominations, that it led to the infamous nullification crisis. Here uh, you see a cartoon against the idea of nullification uh, which I'll talk about in a second, but uh, despotism is built upon a foundation of nullification in this cartoon. People in South Carolina were outraged by the tariff of abominations, and they were all led by John C. Calhoun, shown here in an early photograph. Calhoun was demanding that it be repealed. Some South Carolinians were even, say, were even saying their state ought to just pack up and leave the United States. They ought to just secede. Even though he was Jackson's vice president for a while, Calhoun was, was uh, so against this tariff uh, that his tensions with, his tensions with Jackson grew. And, uh, you know, Calhoun was also worried about well, there were more radical elements in South Carolina that were talking about secession. And so what he ended up doing was he ended up uh, writing what became known as the South Carolina Exhibition and Protest. It's sort of a way to defuse the, the more ardent radical secessionists in his own state. Calhoun advanced the idea of nullification, an idea that any state could simply declare that any given federal law simply didn't apply to them. Obviously, the, this raised questions of sovereignty. In this case, uh, Calhoun declared that uh, South Carolina wouldn't adhere by the tariff of abominations. It didn't apply to South Carolina because of the principle of nullification. Jackson didn't like the tariff of 1820 any more than Calhoun, but he, you know, as president, he wasn't going to stand for the, the idea of nullification. Uh, obviously not for secession, but de not, not for nullification either. And so as South Carolina legislature passed the South Carolina Exhibition and Protest supporting nullification, Jackson attempted a lower tariff, a sort of a compromise, the tariff of 1832. Many in South Carolina still thought, however, that the tariff of 1832 was too high still, 
and Jackson and Calhoun were, were having really strained relations. In late 1832, the South Carolina legislature in a special session explicitly and formally declared the tariffs of both 1828 and 1832 unconstitutional and thus forbid the duties in the state after February 1st, 1833. Jackson was ticked. Angry, he declared, hey, I could use force if necessary to uh, collect these the federal tariff money. You know, he wasn't a big fan of the tariff, but for him, it was a matter of sovereignty. This is the quote. I consider then the power to annul a law of the U.S. assumed by one state incompatible with the existence of a union, he declared. Quote, the laws of the U.S. must be executed, unquote. Jackson sent General Winfield Scott to Charleston Harbor with a man of war and seven revenue ships, together with reinforcements of federal soldiers. He then went before Congress to request what he called a force bill, specifically authorizing him to use the Army to force compliance with the federal tariff. Actually, Jackson probably already had that power under the Constitution, but figured an approval from Congress would strengthen his hands. Because Jackson, by the way, pushed this force bill and also vetoed a lot of uh, other congressional laws, you know, it, that, the, that was the reason the Whigs had called him King a Andrew the First. South Carolina officially denounced the force bill and began to mobilize its state militia for a fight. The United States was very near a civil war. Just as the Civil War seemed like it was ready to begin, Henry Clay of Kentucky offered a compromise tariff that saved the day. Clay, the old war hawk of the War of 1812, had earlier made the Missouri Compromise over slavery. And later on, I should add, he helped make something called the Compromise of 1850. And together with this compromise he's proposing for the nullification crisis, it's going to make him the uh, known as the Great Compromiser. Clay's Compromise of Compromise Tariff of 1833 was passed the same day as Jackson's force bill. Clay's idea was to lower the tariff gradually in steps until 1842. By 1842, the tariff on cotton, the Southwest's biggest complaint, would be cut in half. Now, many South Carolinians weren't still happy, you know, with the, with the comp Compromise Tariff of 1833. But uh, it sufficiently diffused the nullification crisis that the United States avoided the Civil War. Of course, uh, not, not the issue of slavery would crop up again in a Civil War, but at least the issue of the tariff had been diffused that there wouldn't be war immediately. In looking at Jefferson's policies overall, in most ways you can see him enacting the policies of the Democrats. In 1830, he vetoed the Maysville Road Bill. Passed by Congress, the bill authorized the government to buy stock in a road from Maysville, Kentucky to Lexington, Kentucky. Now that was Clay's, Lexington was Clay's hometown, Henry Clay's hometown, and the road lay entirely within the state of Kentucky. And while it eventually planned to link up with the National Road in Cincinnati, Jackson said it should have been paid for simply by the state of, of Kentucky, not federal tax dollars. Again, you see the Democrats' resistance to federal money for internal improvements. Jackson and the Democrats, uh, Jackson himself, you know, he wasn't rabid on the issue of internal improvements. He kind of actually wanted to continue to span the, the national road. But so many of his fellow Democrats were against it that he vetoed it. And, uh, you know, that really angered the proponents of uh, the, the uh, you know, that angered the Whigs and, and Congress who had helped pass it. The, uh, because of the force bill and the, and the veto of a lot of bills, not just the Maysville Road Bill. Again, this is why the Whigs called him King Andrew, Andrew the First, and where the Whigs got their name as the opposition party to quote King Andrew the First. In 1835, when the old Federalist Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice John Marshall died, Jackson appointed his friend Roger Taney of Maryland Chief Justice. Now he was from the South, Maryland, and he was much more accepting of the old states' rights positions. He had, uh, was at the time Jackson's Secretary of Treasury. It was Taney, of course, I should add here, who would later rule in the infamous Dred Scott decision in the 1850s. Uh, that, that's discussed uh, in, a, in, a, in a different video. Anyway, two years later in 1837, it was Taney who wrote the majority opinion in the famous case Charles River Bridge, the Charles River Bridge case. It was Charles River Bridge versus uh, Warren Bridge officially. 
The Massachusetts legislature had granted a number of years before monopoly to one company to build bridges in the area. A second company applied later to build the Charles River Bridge and, and got it. The first one sued as a breach of contract. Taney's court said that the second company could build the bridge despite the state's earlier contract. Governments couldn't inhibit new enterprises by implied privileges under old charters, Taney ruled. The logic was the government should step back, which would promote general happiness, the, the ultimate role of government. So you can see sort of, uh, you know, Taney uh, taming government here, sort of a democratic uh, objective. The best example of Jackson promoting the ideals of the New Democratic Party was his efforts to fight the Second Bank of the United States. The Second Bank of the United States' 20-year charter was coming up, and uh, there was a proposal for a third bank of the United States, again with a 20-year charter. And when the Second uh, Bank's charter was nearing expiration and the, and the Congress proposed a new bank, Jackson vetoed the bill for the new bank. Here's a, a cartoon showing him uh, going after the bank's supporters. It's a very pro-Jackson cartoon. Jackson, however, could, couldn't even wait for the, the second bank to expire. He was so angry at it. Jackson was particularly angry at the second bank's president, Nicholas Biddle. He claimed Nicholas Biddle had been giving influential friends of his uh, you know, loans and special privileges and so, like I say, Jackson, he, the, he vetoed the third bank, but the second bank's charter had not quite run out yet. It was approaching, but hadn't quite run out. And what Jackson decided to do was he decided to pull the federal funds and place them in state banks. And, you know, that way the, the, the second bank would still exist until it expired, but it'd really be just a, an empty shell. You know, they, uh, Biddle was, of course, ticked off and tried to fight Jackson, but that still wasn't enough to stop him. Again, the Whigs used all of this to claim that Jackson was acting like King Andrew the first. And again, that's where they got their, their name, the Whigs, from. This is going to include the uh, video on Jackson's domestic policies.